Yay! Apparently that's the way I opened them all. <laughs> Thanks again for coming out and you know making time for me. Uh, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, a little bit about your background and your. I'm Jim Murphy. Been teaching yoga here for a long, long time. <laughs> so, um, I guess I started yoga in um, the late fall of 1999. Oh, you meant a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, my teacher at that time was a woman named Belinda Vogel. And my first classes were at Quartz Plus Fitness. Oh! And it was the worst possible yoga room in the world because it was, you know, used for their aerobics classes. And so they had mirrors all around and bright fluorescent lights. And it was always freezing cold in there because, you know, they didn't want to get overheated. So it was really cold. At any rate, <laughs> shortly after I'd been teaching, you know, taking her classes, um, she left town and she said, well, you should uh, <laughs> continue with your yoga studies. I also teach up at the Spirit Room. So then I came up here and then I met John Epson and Carrie Mickelson, who were teaching Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga here. Oh. Um, and which is very different from the Iyengar style that Belinda Vogel had been doing. Uh, so it was a much more dynamic, moving practice, synchronization of the breath with and I really liked that. But I, I have to say the thing I liked about Belinda was one of the first things she talked about was the Yoga Sutras, and particularly the Yamas and the Niyamas. And that interested me from the very beginning that yoga had ethics as one of its foundational principles. I'm, uh, I'm pretty ignorant on yoga. What is, uh, you said it's the Niyamas and the Yamas? The Yamas and the Niyamas. What so I Patanjali started, you know, it, the Yoga Sutras is kind of the, the seminal yoga text, and it describes the science of yoga in 196 short aphorisms or threads. And he starts out by saying that, um, you know, yoga is meditation. Yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. But then later on, he goes on to describe it as being like the eight limbs of a tree. Um, and the first two limbs are the yamas and the niyamas, which are ethical precepts. Yeah. The, the yamas are restraints that um, have to do with your dealings with people in the outside world. So, you know, being nonviolent, being truthful, um, not being covetous of other people's things, um, being controlled in your dealings with uh, people in your sexuality, things like that. Kind of the, the negative human aspects yeah. you need to let go. The niyamas are more, have to do with internal states, it's sort of like your relationship with yourself. Um, so uh, purity and contentment and intensity of practice. And Interesting. Devotion to self-study. Okay, so, well, and the idea, when he starts out the book and says that yoga is meditation, um, you know, to just, in our Western world, we're not accustomed to yeah. like, trying to quiet the mind. And if you're filled with rage and anger and murderous intent, you're not going to have very good success when you sit down to try and meditate. So he's saying, you know, you have to kind of get self straight with the world and straight with yourself before you can get serious about undertaking meditation. I mean, I suppose that makes a whole lot of yeah. sense. <laughs> so, only thirdly does he list asana, which is what most people in the West think yoga is you know, doing the yeah. physical postures. And the only mention of, the phys of asana that he makes in the whole book is that it's a strong, steady seat, meaning that it's, it's a firm foundation for practice of meditation. Oh. That's a lot different than what I uh, think of as yoga. So. Yeah. yeah, we think of it as you know, putting your foot behind your head. Yeah, exactly, it's you not, know, it's... doing stretches. Yeah, and... well, it can be that, too. Yoga is a lot of things. It's a very complex, ancient tradition involving you know, many different aspects. So. so what is your practice exactly like? Well, I practice Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. So Ashtanga... Um, makes a reference right there to Patanjali, the eight limbs of yoga, 
Vinyasa just simply means synchronization of the breath with the movement. And yoga means lots of things, but it's, again, it, it can mean um, union of the individual self with universal consciousness. So it was taught primarily by um, BKS Iyengar's teacher and uh, Patabi Joy's teacher, uh, Krishnamacharya, who was in India. And those two teachers came out with very different interpretations of this type of yoga. So um, Iyengar's style was more static and involved using lots of bolsters and props and straps and things like that. Um, he studied at a different time uh, later in Krishnamacharya's life with him and probably had a little more therapeutic aspect to uh, the yoga. Uh, Patabi Joy studied with him when he was a very young man and when Krishnamacharya was younger and it's very dynamic, the idea being that you're gonna build heat in the body and concentrate prana in the body and purify the internal organs and purify the mind so it's more active. It's interesting how diverse it is. Yeah. Like you said before, I mean, most people just think, you know, yeah. it's the stretches. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and Krishnamacharya's uh, grandson, Desikachar, studied with him when he was much older, and there he was more dedicated to yoga, totally as therapy, and designed individual therapeutic sequences for people who were trying to address problems from specific ailments. So is that more of what your class is like? I've heard your class is really intense. No, my, my <laughs> class is more like the first from uh, taught by Patavi Joins. So it's a set sequence of poses um, set to set sequences of breathing. And you know, it, the practice is about 90 minutes long. Um, you know, we start out with sun salutations, then we move through a series of standing poses, then we move into a series of seated poses, then we do some back bends and some inversions. Oh, wow. And then spend some time resting at the end. So it's a. Uh, so it's pretty dynamic. <laughs> it's definitely for uh, people, though, that maybe have a little bit of experience in them. Well, no, not necessarily. As it was uh, primarily taught in Mysore, India, uh, you would come and you wouldn't go through a group led class meet with the teacher individually oh. and learn the poses one by one and memorize them and you know at, as you became proficient they would add on poses until oh, you got up to the point where it was more of a self-sustaining practice interesting so, so even you know it's appropriate for you know even total beginners you know they probably feel a little overwhelmed <laughs> um, but that was how it was traditionally taught you know, your yeah. first day in class, you'd probably only practice for 20 minutes and you'd try and learn how to do the first sun salutation and then go into Shavasana and rest. So basically, if like a newcomer comes into your class, you just let them kind of well, come I let, along. I just, they... you know, warn them to take it easy and do what they can and just sit and observe and rest. That's, a, that's different than what, uh, what I had been led to believe. Like, I, I was in there thinking, Oh man, they say he's intensive, like it's gotta be exhausting. He's just flipping through a bunch of stuff. Well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of cool. So you were, you were saying, so you came over from courts and then you came over here and started taking these classes. Yeah. So what led you into teaching your own classes? Well, as so often happens, um, you know, somebody doesn't show up for a class and the most senior student ends up leading the class. Oh. So just, there wasn't anybody else. So um, eventually I went to Wilmer, Minnesota and studied with Mary Beth Neal at the yoga lot and got um, a yoga teacher certification with the Yoga Alliance. Um, but I had already been teaching for like six or seven years before I did that. Oh, so what was the benefit of getting the certificate then? Just to be, well, it, it was very interesting meeting her and you know furthering my studies. Um, so, and just, I suppose. just to have an official certification, yes. Most most people who go through um, 
yoga teacher training classes um, haven't practiced themselves very much, and so they don't they aren't able to absorb a lot. So the, usually, you know, you can tell if the teacher knows what they're doing just is based more on the depth of their own personal practice than on any book learning or classroom experience they've had. So I, I, I encourage my students themselves to try and practice at home as much as they can because you know, the ideal uh, for a yoga teacher, I think, would be to instill a sense of interest and devotion to the subject to the point where it would become self-sustaining for the students and they'd be able to practice on their own and they wouldn't need a teacher. So the teacher should ideally render himself useless. Kind of obsolete after a exactly. certain point. Exactly. I mean, I could definitely agree with that. I mean, I definitely felt there were courses when I went through college that did not achieve that, yeah. so it's pretty easy to see when you've got a good teacher versus the, versus the lazy one. <laughs> That's kind of interesting though. It had to have been interesting the first time that you had to get up and teach though. Well, yeah, but it, you know, it's usually just with a small group of friends, so, and you know, I don't think of, I don't think of my, even in my classes now, I don't think of myself so much as the teacher as just another yoga student. Even though I've been doing it for a very long time and I am leading the class, I'm still you know, engaged very much in the process of self-inquiry and self-realization, and I hope they are too. So it's not like you know, my experience is all that different from theirs. I suppose that's a good mentality to go into it too. Probably helps them be a lot more comfortable when yeah. they're. Well, you know. in, in yoga, kind of opens things up, and it's like the more you know, or the more you think you know, the more you realize that there's a lot more to know. So it's like you kind of, after you've been studying it for you know ten or fifteen years, it's like you start to think, wow, I don't know anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool though. I mean, yeah. it's interesting that the rabbit hole goes that deep. Yeah, it, well, it does. <laughs> you know, it goes back to just the idea that the general public thinks it's all about just the stretches, you know, because that's, that's how I was before I started actually talking with all of you. It's just, that's, you know, that's how WeFit markets it too. I don't know if you've ever played Wii, but like it's pretty much just all poses and they don't really treat it as more than that. Right. So, uh, well, I mean, I, I was definitely um, interested in yoga for its physical aspects. That's what initially drew me in. I was a long distance runner and I kept on injuring myself. My wife encouraged me to go to classes to try and alleviate some of the problems I was encountering from overuse and injury from running. Oh, yeah. I mean. uh, so, you know, initially that's what drew me in, but it's more the meditative and spiritual aspects of it that I think are more important. Because as you age, regardless of whether you keep yourself in good shape and you know try and avoid injury, you know, eventually the body decays and you know, like these advanced asanas that you're doing start to you start instead of accumulating them, you know, you start to give them back. So, you know, there are things that I used to be able to do that I can't do now, but, you know, yeah. I, I, tell, <laughs> I tell people that, you know, by the time you learn how to put your foot behind your head, that probably won't be important to you. That's not what it's really about. I suppose once you get to that point, it's like, oh yeah, I realize there's actually a lot more going on here. So, uh, so we actually have a question, this is the first time this has ever happened, okay. uh, from our, our wonderful Facebook world. This is uh, Kylie Wheeler, who is, uh, oh. yeah, she's one of your students. Okay. She's wanting to know what your favorite pose is uh, to teach and why. My favorite pose to teach is, is Viravadrasana. Um, it's warrior pose. So you have the front leg deeply bent, it's a standing pose where the front leg is deeply bent and the back leg is straight. And okay. you bring your, your arms up. And I guess because um, it involves, it's very energetic and 
you're drawing energy up through the earth, through your legs, through your core, and sending it up into space through your hands. And so it takes a lot of alignment to get it right. You have to have some flexibility in the shoulders and in the torso, and particularly in the hips, in order to achieve it. Um, but it immediately gives students a sense of power and energize. I guess once you nail it, it uh, yeah, I could see why it would. It's, yeah. one, it's one of the few poses I knew yeah. <laughs> once you started talking about it. <laughs> yeah, my knowledge is uh, super limited. Basically, it's uh, Sun and Warrior are like the only two I know. <laughs> but yeah, I can see that. That would be a fun pose to teach people too. I'm sure it yeah. helps to kind of build that confidence so they're like, yeah, I can kind of do this. <laughs> um, so what is one of the funniest things that's happened in your classes? You've been teaching for so long. Um, well, uh, one of the things that happened um, <clears throat> was that uh, Kylie, who you just mentioned, was going to come to class, but of course she forgot that it was spring forward or fall back. I can't remember <laughs> which one it was, the ch change of time. So she showed up uh, after we were already an hour into class. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't ever, I don't ever lock the doors or, you know, yeah. so if someone wants to come in late or early, that's fine. I don't usually worry about stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I suppose there's no reason really to, it's not necessarily a, uh, well, you don't want to disrupt the, the flow of the class, yeah. but it's fine. You know, any yoga that you can do is better than no yoga. <laughs> That's funny, though. I feel like we've all made that mistake before. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing my phone updates the time, otherwise I never, <laughs> I never remember. <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to make this the final question because okay. I do know you have to get ready for your stuff. So uh, this is the hard question. What is... What would you consider your life goal? It doesn't necessarily have to be yoga related, which is like your over, over umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I don't know, that's, um, you know, I guess it is related to yoga. Um, and it goes back to what I said about trying to help people. Um, yoga, you know, is very ancient. It has lots of, elements to it, it can seem overwhelmingly complex, but if you reduce it to just a few simple things, that, that's very much in tune with what I want to do with the rest of my life. And so we just, all we're trying to do is use our breath to open up the body, make the body healthy, to make the mind calm, that calmness and health that we experience in the body um, gives you an, an kind of really strong sense of happiness and contentment. So I'd like to help other people just dis discover that for themselves and then be able to practice it for themselves. That's a really nice goal. <laughs> well, I certainly hope you, uh, you achieve your goal. I feel like you're uh, at least on the right path if that's what you're going for. <laughs> well, thank you again for taking okay. all this time. Uh, Kylie sends love. Okay. <laughs>